Well, dear friends, thank you so much for coming today. Um, the bravest of you are here because it's such a technical title you know, for which I have no apologies. Uh, the dominant seventh chord. Uh, you can see this is uh, the person, Jean-Philippe Rameau, who uh, was the first to describe, theorize it. Um, he called it something else, which I'm going to tell you about a, a little bit later. But first, we are going to hear the dominant seventh chord, and then you will see how exciting it is. <laughs> you see everyone screaming. That's how exciting dominant seventh chord is, right? So, uh, so what do we do? You know, how do we get this chord? Well, you already know the major triad. We were talking about it uh, last time. So, um, that's oh, lovely. Yeah, that's the major triad. Add another third on top, and that makes it a dissonant chord. Um, I can't remember whether I had time last time to discuss consonance and dissonance, but I will be very brief just to mention that consonance intervals yeah, or chords is uh, something that blends together very well. And dissonant ones don't. Yeah? So the only consonance that everyone seems to agree on in the world is this one, which is an octave. Yeah? So we agree on it so, so much that we consider it the same note. Yeah? So if it's a prana and a bass, uh, are asked to sing the same note, they will sing it probably an octave or maybe two octaves apart. So that's the only one we agree on. Then there is this one, the fifth, and that's already uh, a cultural thing, yeah, because not every culture would necessarily recognize it as something very pleasant or, or as notes blending together. But this note, yeah, really creates some tension, yeah, it creates uh, dissonance. And uh, it seems that we want to do something with this chord. We cannot just uh, leave it hanging. So uh, the moment it was defined was in 1722 in the Harmonic Treatise by Rameau. Um, and he defines it immediately as something that has to go to another chord. Yes, yeah, so, so actually what he calls it is dominant tonique. It's a very confusing word. All the musical terms are actually quite illogical and confusing, yeah? Because, so we call it, we are going to call it the dominant seventh. The seventh because it has this interval of the seventh between the first and fourth note. And dominant because it's built on the fifth step or fifth note of the scale, yeah? So uh, if we count, uh, Why do we call it the dominant? Why is it dominant? We, I've just told you that it's the tonic which is the most domineering chord yeah, in, the, in the key. So that is a historical term, and it comes from um, recitations of biblical texts. Yeah? So if you have a recitation in, uh, in a liturgy, you will have it usually on one note. Yeah, and that note usually was note five of the mode. So uh, traditionally, it was called dominant because it was domineering within that passage of recitation. So basically, it's not dominant here, but Rameau inherits this term. So he calls it dominant tonique because it actually has to go somewhere. And he decides that it has to go into the tonic. Yeah? So it's not a chord on its own. It's part of what we call the progression. Not even succession of chords, but progression because there is a need for it to go somewhere. Yeah, so there is an understanding that because it's so distant, it has to resolve. Yeah, so that's what he does. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to read what he did here. Yeah, so yeah, that's what he does. So that's his dominant tonic, dominant and tonic, uh, 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 dominant seventh chord with the resolution. Or uh, in the minor, it will be the same chord. Right, so. Uh, We've got a definition. That, now let us hear it in practice. Um, if, we, if we take the trio from the minuet of Mozart's symphony number 41, which is his last symphony, he plays with that chord and its resolution. So you'll hear it several times, very clearly, in the horns.
Tschüss. So uh, that's, that's quite, quite easy to hear. So because we like so much to discover uh, the origins of something, yeah, the origins of this chord, so who was the first to use it? Uh, so people have been searching uh, and uh, been very preoccupied by this question, who was the first person to use the dominant seventh? Now, if you just think about it without a context, yeah, just as a combination of notes, you can go back to the 14th century and find that combination of notes. But it won't necessarily resolve into the tonic. Yeah? So with the, with the context that we are familiar with, uh, we have to go to um, the beginning of the 17th century to the madrigals of Claudio Monteverdi. And I'm going to play you an example from a madrigal on, on the sec second page of the score. Uh, you will hopefully hear that chord appearing. And I'll make some gesture to indicate where it comes. It's a very beautiful piece. Sorry. It in a different key, yeah, but and nevertheless, yeah, you, you picked up. This is where it appears, and uh, it appears kind of without preparation. Monteverdi actually breaks the rules of counterpoint deliberately um, and uh, introduces this, this seventh, this dissonant note on top, yeah, with a leap, um, not even preparing it in any way. And uh, why we know that it actually did cause consternation, because um, another musician uh, who was called Artusi uh, started criticizing him for, for him for that and saying, you know, you're introducing all these kinds of things, um, all these strange sonorities that we don't want, they're unpleasant. And Monteverdi republished in Madrigals uh, with, a, with a note that that's exactly what I mean to do. This is the new style. Yeah, so tough. Yeah, basically accept this. Uh, but you shouldn't imagine that after Monteverdi, then people immediately started using this chord. Yeah, so it, it happened very gradually. And in fact, in the 17th century, in the middle of the 7th century, there's a kind of gap in music history. We're not quite sure what happens and how, uh, how it happens. But uh, if we uh, go to the, towards the end of the century, we can find that in Lully, for example, in the Lully's Tadeum, there's quite a lot of um, alternation between dominant and tonic, but not the seventh. So, you know, you will hear something like this. Uh, yeah, so the bass goes like this. Yeah, one, five, one, five. But it's still, it's still not the seventh. It's just two triads. So let's hear it. The seventh appears. Uh, they, they play everything, yeah, in a different, uh, in a different tuning, yeah. So that's why we, we all end, end up in a different key. But uh, so this is the seventh. Uh, in the end, it ends up just being without the seventh. Yeah. So he uses it very, very sparingly. But if we go to um, just a few um, decades later. Yeah, so beginning of the 18th century, and we have Corelli. And here we have it just in plain view, the dominant seventh, at least two on the first page. And uh, uh, I'm going to play this and let you hear it. <laughs> Uh, 
you might, might have noticed that he has all these figures yeah, in, in between the musical lines. So what do they mean? Some of them are sevenths, and in fact, the ones that I uh, showed, pointed out as the dominant sevenths were also marked by a seventh. So that was the practice of the so-called basso continuo, or thorough bass, or figured bass, as it was written in the score. So this practice actually uh, arose in Monteverdi's time, but at first it was just to indicate for, say, an accompanying harpsichord, which note they had to add, which note they exactly they had to play. So there were figures like figure 15, and then you would have to count the 15 notes and play exactly that note. But gradually, this practice helps people to think of chords as these abstract units. Yeah? So if it says seven, it can be uh, this, or it can be this, or it can be a... Yeah, the harpsichordist can improvise, but it will be still consisting of the same notes. And the main thing is the bass will always be the same. So all the notes you know, are uh, at the disposal of the harpsichordist, but he knows that they have to belong to the seventh. So that practice actually helped establish chords as these kind of abstract things that people could think of as, you know, well, despite all the decorations around it, I can still hear that it's the dominant seventh chord. So uh, Corelli, I mean, we don't talk about him that much. Yeah, we don't remember him as much as we do Beethoven, for example, or Mozart. But at the time, what he did was extremely uh, interesting yeah, and pleasing for people. And this is, for example, um, what Francesco Gasparini has said about him, that this practice, followed by the better modern composers, is found particularly in the extremely delightful symphony of Arcangelo Corelli, supreme virtuoso of the violin, true Orpheus of our time, who moves and shifts his basses with so much artfulness, care, and grace, using these ties and dissonances so well controlled and resolved, and so well interwoven with a variety of themes, that one may well say he has rediscovered the perfection of ravishing harmony. So people felt that this was something new in something extremely beautiful. Yeah, they liked it, what they did. Charles Bernier, who wrote his History of Music uh, in 1776, and between 1776 and 88 or something like that, uh, he said, scarce a contemporary musical writer, historian, or poet neglected to celebrate his genius and talents. And his productions have contributed longer to charm the lovers of music by the mere powers of the bow, without the assistance of the human voice than those of any composer that has yet existed. And I think this is a very interesting point. Yeah, by the mere power of the bow, without the assistance of the human voice. Which means that Corelli played his role in the development of instrumental music without text. Yeah, without the voice, which means without the text. So usually, yeah, if we have the text, we don't have to worry so much you know, where the music moves, because the text binds it all together. We're interested in the text. But if you don't have the text, we need something else which makes us sit on the edge of our seat yeah, and ask, what next? What's next? Where are, you, where are we going? So it's the power of this dominant seventh which propels us forward. It's because we want to resolve it. So, uh, why indeed we want to resolve it? Yeah, why is it if I play this to you and just walk off, you will feel uh, unsatisfied? Why is this? Yeah, uh, people talk about the gravitational pull of the tonic. Somehow it just wants wants to resolve there. Yeah, you, it, it is a metaphor, obviously. But um, Ramon, actually being one of these great Enlightenment scholars, believed that he's made a scientific discovery, that he discovered a law of nature, that you know, this is how things are in nature, that the dominant servant has to resolve into the tonic. Well, this has been disproven, yeah, because actually if you play it to somebody who has never heard Western music at all, yeah, to some kind of uh, remote, say, remote hermit living somewhere in, in the midst of Siberia yeah, or in Amazonian jungle, they might not necessarily want to resolve it. Yeah? So it's really a cultural thing. It's, it's a thing that we developed as a result of practice of Western music. So, uh, let's talk about this chord as a questioning chord. 
for this, I've chosen the very small piece, Yabai Chopin, which is very familiar to you. So you will hear the first little phrase, which stops on the dominant seventh. And then, and it sounds like a question. It sounds incomplete. And then the second phrase, uh, which is, seems to answer it. And then he, he alternates between them. He keeps uh, sort of um, asking you questions with, with music and, um, and providing some reassurance. And then towards the end of this little piece, he asks you the question even more intensely by using a dominant seventh, which leads you into a different key. But actually, it doesn't go there. Yeah, but you will see, you will feel this, this level of intensity uh, rising. Uh, and then, you know, it all resolves to the tonic. So let us hear it from, from that point of view. Um. Yeah, so there's further level of complexity here that I don't want to go into. Yeah, it's about that, that climactic, most intense dominant seventh. But uh, let, let's stop here for a moment. So now I would like to invite our quartet, the Bodman Quartet, to actually uh, illustrate something for us. So if we can have them, please give them a little bit of applause. So what I wanted to demonstrate, uh, with the help of the Bodman Quartet, is uh, we're going to go to the finale of the Haydn Quartet, Opus 9, number 5. And it's an interesting piece because it actually uses this, this questioning chord on a different level. Yeah, so you hear quite a long passage of music, uh, which Sounds, then suddenly stops on the dominant seventh. So if you could illustrate for us, yeah, just that little passage so that you remember it when you hear it. Yeah, so where, where do we go from there? Where do we go from there? Well, the first time, yeah, we're actually going to go back to the start, yeah, because it's a repeat of that whole section. And the second time when we heal that score, he will take us somewhere else, yeah, because we're going into the de development section where he will go to in other keys and even to the minor. Yeah? So yeah, and every time you hear this question, you hear this dominant seventh, you realize that this is another section finished. Yeah, and uh, um, eventually we, we will end up with resolving it, hopefully, yeah, in the home key. So um, now uh, I would like you to perform the whole of the finale. I'm just going to sit down, so let's enjoy a little musical break and listen for these wonderful dominant sevens. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Haydn liked inventing these things. Yeah, you can imagine that he was, you know, when he was working for Count Esterhazy, yeah, and he wanted to, to do something new every single time. Yeah, so you can imagine people would be sitting there uh, hearing this for the first time and were really excited about these questioning phrases. Yeah, because nobody had done that before. So uh, stay with us for a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about other pieces which also um, have these questions. Um, once we've established yeah, that it's a questioning chord, you can use it in a very subtle way in pieces with text, uh, which is what Schumann does in the first song of his Dichterliebe cycle, yeah, which is the poet's love. Yeah, so the poet falls in love and asks this big question, will she love me? Yeah, and what he does the most amazing thing. Uh, he basically centers this whole piece around the dominant sevens and doesn't resolve it. Yeah? Then, of course, the second song will come, so it's not, it's not that fatal, right, that it's not resolved. But it gives us a sense yeah, that the question hangs in the air. The, the question will be resolved. You can guess it's not, it's not going to be good. <laughs> Schönen Monat Mai, als alle Knospen sprangen, da ist in meinem Herzen die Liebe hanging in the air. And association of the dominant seventh with this unquenchable longing might have come from one of the, um, uh, the favorite uh, poets by, by Schumann, um, E.T.A. Hoffman, uh, who describes, I'm not sure whether I, yeah, I have it here, sorry, just lost my, my place, uh, where he describes in one of his um, little novellas hearing a dominant seventh 
in nature, yeah, the wind is blowing uh, a gale, and he says it was in the depth of autumn, and in the calm of the night, uh, wafted in by a light breeze, I could clearly perceive long sustained notes, sometimes like a muffled organ pipe, at other times like the tolling of a distant bell. I could often distinguish clearly between a low um, F and a fifth, C, sometimes an E flat was added a third above, so. what he's describing, um, the notes producing a piercing seventh chord whose aura of deep lament suffused my soul with melancholy and even horror. <laughs> yeah, so um, maybe a bit too much, but if you imagine yeah, that if this was a triad, a major triad, and he would, heard it, he would have heard it produced by the wind, he would have been delighted yeah, because that's the chord of nature. Everything is good, everything is well. But if nature gives you a dissonant chord, yeah, then there's something is not, is not good with the harmony of the spheres. Yeah, something is really disturbing happening. So this is a kind of romantic attitude to life that Schumann also wanted to portray. Uh, but for another example, I wanted to show you another piece which also ends with uh, dominant seventh, but in a very different way. It's a Chopin's prelude in F major, and he adds this seventh. It almost ends like on a normal triad, but he adds this seventh very high up. And uh, if you remember what I was telling you last time about the harmonic series, yeah, actually the overtone number seven, yeah, harmonic number seven is actually very close to this seventh. It's not quite exactly what you get on the piano, but it's close. It's slightly less dissonant than, than the, the one on the piano. So uh, I think Chopin is trying to pretend that it's actually a stable chord at the end, yeah, because it's kind of harmonic series. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> it depends on performance very much. I've chosen the one where it, it, it is not too prominent. So, uh, so he is trying to make it a more kind of natural um, chord. Uh, in, in another piece, which also ends on the dominant seventh chord, it's, um, uh, it's a kind of comedy piece by Tchaikovsky, which he tried to represent a peasant playing the accordion, or very primitive accordion, a concertina. Yeah, so there are only two chords uh, that he, he uses there. And he ends on the dominant seventh because, well, maybe he's just moved out of view, you know, or maybe he doesn't realize that he has to resolve it, right? So. To, to the next chapter, which is how do you change direction? Yeah, so if you have just a dominant and tonic, which is what you've just heard, yeah, it would be a very boring piece. Yeah, so you need to do something else to, uh, to create interest and um, kind of diverse progr progressions. So if you imagine that our tonality our, in, in a piece is like an apartment, well, for example, if this is a plan of a Mozart's apartment in Vienna, Yes, yeah, so there is a central room from which you can go in a number of places. So imagine that you're kind of gliding yeah, through these rooms and you might come back to the central room from a different side. You don't have to, to come back yeah, the same way. You can see it in 3D as well. So if you imagine that these rooms are different keys yeah, and the central room is our home key, so you will realize this is how modulation works in the piece. Yeah? So when we want to change direction, yeah, we we'll go into another room. And the best thing that we can do, the most effective way to move from one room to another is to use a dominant seventh chord that belongs already to the other room. Yeah, that really sort of shoots us in. Yeah, because then you get the new gravitational pull of the tonic that we haven't yet heard. Yeah, so um, what I would like you now to do uh, is to play as the, it, it will be from the same Haydn quartet that we have heard, but the first movement. And it's a theme which the first, where the first phrase 
um, uh, ends with the modulation, basically ends in another room. And it, it's precisely, you will hear this kind of slightly alien chord which takes us there. So if you could just play us this first phrase. here, although it ends on a, on a major triad, I think you already you know, should feel a little bit of dissatisfaction. You're, you're somehow not home. You have to get home. And it's the second phrase that is going to reverse the process and get you back in. But before that, you will go to some other rooms yeah, before you come, come back home. That's better, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it brings us where, to the room where we've started out from. Now I'm going to uh, let them go for a moment. They are going to come back in about 20 minutes. Yes, yeah? so thank you very much. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to show you another way, yeah, of playing with with this the same kind of idea. Yeah, so you already heard this Mozart symphony. You heard this dominant seventh chord. We'll now see where he goes next. Yeah, so he goes to another room, again, to a minor key. It's loud music. And then pay attention to how he comes back. That's very interesting. whether you've noticed, yeah, but he actually made a few false moves before he came back. Yeah, he, he used the same chord, chord progression, dominant and tonic, but in the wrong key. Yeah, so he ended up in two wrong, uh, wrong rooms, and, and then finally he gets back. Yeah, and he uh, emphasizes this by using the horns again, so which remind you that this is your home now. Now, here is a, a, another sort of slightly uh, jokey example, but it's, it shows you the power of the dominant sevenths and how much we care about harmony. Yeah, so Stravinsky, in around 1944, was, was given this commission to harmonize the American um, national anthem. And he did it in his own Stravinskyan way, right? So uh, it's, it's a little bit maybe jokey at times. But the, um, it offended them so much that they actually called the police. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, he played it with, with the Boston, Boston Orchestra, and then the Massachusetts police were investigating him for misappropriating the anthem. Yeah, so what did he do? Uh, so you will notice that, well, I mean, you know that the music, yeah, so you know when it's supposed to come home. Yeah, so you already expect it in, in, a, you know, in a few moves still left, but you already know you're coming home. So you're expecting the harmonic movement towards home. And at that point, you know, he derails it, yeah, because he uses the dominant seventh chord from another key. Yeah, and that pushes us away from the home key. And we are horrified yeah, because it's, it sounds wrong. So let's test this.
up first, ta 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 yeah, and then decides to do something else. And this chord turns into uh, a, not just a threshold, but a portal and takes it to another room, you know, another dimension. You don't expect to get, get here. Yeah, you step over, you're in a magical kingdom somewhere else where you didn't expect to be. So this is what Haydn, again Haydn, does in his symphony number 55. And for that, he has to respell this chord. He has to rename one of the notes. So he goes on with this, and you expect it to go here. And then he says, well, this is not actually a D flat, it's a C sharp. It's the same note, yeah, different name, but then it has to go up. And it goes into the minor. Yes, so you didn't expect this. He was the first person to sort of try these out. And then a few moments later, he comes back through the same trick, again, through the portal, yeah, not through the normal course. This is quite hard to hear, but I will, um, I'm going to test you anyway. comes back. Yeah, but it's again this, he pauses on this chord. Yeah, and we don't, don't know where it's going to go. It comes back. So, you know, they were playing with this a lot. Uh, in, in the most magical way, Tchaikovsky used, used this, this device in uh, his Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, so just before the wonderful magical love theme, he establishes this chord, which is the dominant seven. holds it for a long time, yeah? And you know, you, well, you think it's going to go in there, but it goes somewhere else, yeah? So it goes actually in, in a magical key. He goes through the really magical portal. So it's a wonderful moment. ends up in the key which is a semitone lower where he was heading than he was heading yeah and it feels like you're in another world yeah you're elevated because it's a love theme and uh, what happens next I don't know whether you've noticed from from the diagram but in the second line of this there are several of these dominant seventh chords that actually do not resolve at all but follow each other And one, two, three, four, five of them, which means that you're not actually, you're just gliding like through an alfilade of rooms, like in a, um, in a palace. Yeah? So you just sort of, without stopping, you go through them. So now, of course, the next thing is how to lose direction with the dominant seventh chord. So imagine that you have two of them and you alternate between them. One pulls you into one place, another one pulls you into yeah, the other place, and you are undecided. Yeah, you have these equal forces pulling you in different directions. So uh, one of the first people to try this out was Mikhail Glinka, and he did it in his opera Ruslan and Ludmila at the moment when um, he, the bride was uh, abducted from the wedding feast. Yeah, so everyone is so flabbergasted by this that they lose, you know, they're under their spell, they lose their sense of direction, and you hear this chords, these magical chords. Mm -hmm. 
somewhere else. By the time they wake up, the bride is far away, right? So the court have kept them under the spell. Uh, and Mussorgsky in Boris Godunov does, does a similar thing, yeah, but for a different reason. He presents you uh, with an orchestral representation of the bells. Yes, he thinks, well, how do you present these bells? Russian bells are not tuned. Uh, deliberately not tuned. Yeah, it was actually an offense to tune a bell because it has to have a character, this completely sort of multiphonic, uh, very complex harmonic spectrum. So he presents it with two dominant sevenths, uh, which are also yeah, just alternating and not resolving. So for quite a long stretch, you have no key. There is no tonality. And it sounds a little bit foreboding yeah, because, you know, this is the coronation scene from Boris Godunov and he's not going to end well, right? There was no key. It was an eternal pass passage, yeah, because you, you were pulled in two different directions. Now, here I would like to introduce uh, the, uh, the idea of inversion. Yeah? So the dominant seventh chord, you can do various things with it. So imagine that these are the four, no four notes, yeah? and the, the one at the bottom is the, the black one is the root. We call it the root. Yeah? Root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. So what if you then take this root and put it an octave up? Is it the same chord or a different chord? And then you can do the same yeah, with the next note. And again, until you rotate it back to the dominant sevenths. Yeah, so it has f three different inversions. Again, inversions is not a good term. We should really have called it rotations or something like that. We have to stick with it, yeah? So, inversions. Now, um, the interesting thing is that they form this kind of different, uh, slightly different sound. They have their own character, yeah? Because uh, if the, uh, the dominant sevens just have the thirds, then the other one, the other ones, all have a second. It's a different interval, yeah, and actually sound, sounds harsher. And if you have it in the bass, it sounds different. It has its own character. So, uh, and uh, again, Charles Burnley tells us that somebody who uh, uh, uses or invented inversions of the dominant seventh conferred as refreshing a benefit on the craving lovers of music as Moses on the thirsty Israelites and producing water with his wand from the rock on Mount Horeb. Yeah, so exactly, a very lovely kind of description of all the diversity these, these chords give us. So, uh, for example, we can start with uh, the first inversion, and Mendelssohn's Song Without Words starts as if we are kind of just walked in on somebody improvising. It starts in medias res. Yeah, it's, it's as if it's not the beginning of the piece. It's a lovely, um, a lovely device. That was the first inversion. So it, it also wants to resolve, but it doesn't have this very definite final kind of you know, move of the bass. It's much gentler, so it leads us into the piece in a very gentle way. But I'm particularly interested in the third inversion, and this is the one that I play to you, because it's a very interest, it has a very interesting um, function in, in Western music, of that of a turning point very often. So, uh, well, 
how to get it? Yeah, we, we get basically uh, at the beginning of Saint-Saëns' first concerto, we get first a very uh, familiar to you, major triad, and then one note is added to it, but it's added in the bass. And the moment you hear it, you almost not don't hear it that's in the strings, but it creates this sense of foreboding. Yeah, and you realize, well, we are, have a lot of a long story to tell, right? to start with yeah as if you uh, as if you're just you know entering a new world a, wo a world yeah once upon a time uh, again Haydn did the thing um, of starting the whole quartet with this chord in a very again witty way as he always does So again, a moment of surprise. You don't expect it to be the first chord in a piece. Uh, Mendelssohn in his Italian symphony uh, in the minuet, uh, he actually uses this chord as a kind of focus of attention. He repeats it all the time. It becomes a very romantic question, again, uh, in the sound of the horns. back to it yeah so it really features it in, in this um, uh, lovely horn sound now Beethoven loved using it because it's, it creates a lot of yeah, disturbance in the bass and uh, Beethoven loved this sort of slightly ugly sound so there is a moment in uh, symphony number no. seven when he uses just two notes there um, and uh, they create in the bass, they create a moment, you know, he doesn't quite resolve it, he re resolves it on a weak beat, yeah, so he keeps going to this third inversion, dominant seventh, and the sense is that, that it's like a needle, yeah, that's got stuck on a record, if any one of you remembers who that, what that is, yeah, so we really feel disturbed, we, we cannot get off, and the moment that when it resolves properly, we all have a sense of relief. Yeah, like, you know, you're really stuck in it. Beethoven loves creating these moments of tension. Uh, now, I would say that this chord is particularly typical of recitatives. Yeah, so if you um, actually uh, look at various operatic recitatives or recitatives in oratorio, there's always some kind of question and answer going on. Sometimes the character will talk to themselves yeah, and say, well, should I do this or should I do that? 
Oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to sing an aria. Yeah, so uh, there's always some kind of in, inner dialogue going on. Well, in, uh, very often this particular chord acts as a turning point, yeah, but, however, so I, it didn't take me very long, sorry, it didn't take me very long to find the moment where it actually um, accentuates the word but, aber, yeah, in, in Matthew fashion. So it's a restative by Jesus, and he says, well, you know, I've been, um, you haven't arrested me uh, so far, you know, I've been sitting there for a long time, and now, um, but, na uh, but he said, aber, yeah, but uh, it's all how it has to be, how it's written in the, in the scriptures, yeah, so let's hear that moment, just a little bit before the aber, and then that chord. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a turning point. And uh, people started using, and Tchaikovsky uses it quite a lot in his operas, as the moment, here's the moment the duet is ending of Olga and Lensky, they are um, in love with each other. And then the chord warns them that someone else is going to come in, yeah? They don't yet see them, but the chord already tells both us and them that someone else is going to enter. Unfortunately, the applause interferes here, so it doesn't work quite so well. have to, to do something, yeah, because the chord came in, the third inversion. Now, we're still in the Queen of Spades uh, when Herman and Lisa are singing their duet and everything seems to be fine. And then says, you know, I will run away any, anywhere with you, anywhere you like. And he says, of course, you know, where are we going to go, she says. And he says, of course, to the gambling house. Yeah, and that's a terrible moment because she realizes he is, he is mad. He's kind of addicted to gambling, yeah, and she doesn't matter to him. That's a really <laughs> terrible turning point, yeah? But that chord again. Um, right, I'm going to miss the, that out and because I, I feel like I'm running out of time. Uh, and just a little kind of epilogue to that uh, will be they move against the dominant seventh. So who would want to go against such a lovely chord? So Russian composers, Russian, um, uh, Russian polymath Vladimir Adoyevsky uh, felt that uh, for Russian composers they had to get away from this dominant tonic uh, relationships, and especially from the dominant sevens, because they wanted to be different from Western composers. Yeah, so this is where they, you start to want to be original, and he feels that this dominant tonic relationship is already too banal. You have to think of something else. Yeah, so he says actually um, that Monteverdi, with Monteverdi as the seventh chord, um, removed the firm foundation from music. Um, and he says it's kind of a sign of degradation yeah, rather than progress. So we have to go back to the roots, uh, to the church modes possibly, yeah, and um, uh, rediscover uh, something that we had lost. And he suggests even, you know, the way to uh, harmonize the scale without it at all. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, avoiding it. Yes, he, he basically tries to suggest ways of harmonize it without uh, using it. And Glinka uh, does exactly that at the very beginning of his overture, Ruslan and, and Ludmila. Uh, although the gesture is very much something like... Uh, but he uses a different chord just to avoid that dominant seventh. 
and it sounds slightly different, but it passes so quickly you won't even notice. Yeah, it could be the same, but it is different. Yeah, it's the alternative, it's the Russian chord, right? We wanted to do things differently. And uh, Mussorgsky, again, you know, while harmonizing the, the, the tune, which could be easily harmonized with the dominant seventh. Something like that. Yeah, in the liturgical music in Russia, this is exactly what would have been used. But he invents a very different. So he, instead of doing uh, so he goes, um, something like that. Yeah, very unusually. It, it creates this very archaic color. Um, and uh, finally, yeah, for our uh, final little recital, I've chosen uh, a movement from Shostakovich's quartet. Uh, which is very unusual. Yeah, so Shostakovich, of course, writes already in the 20th century, and he um, uses all kinds of harmonies. Yeah, so it can be very difficult, yeah, harmonic progressions. But this chord, this movement, is mainly based on this third inversion, dominant seventh. And you will hear that the, the three... Uh, three of the, the, the musicians will be almost constantly holding it. And the violin will be reacting to it uh, by way of producing her uh, recitative. Yeah? It's, so it's an imitation already, a kind of neoclassical rendition of recitative by a quartet. And you will hear how these chords, yeah, familiar from the 18th century, sound very different. Uh, in this context, and these recitatives become incredibly intense and incredibly moving. And only at the very end, almost going into this kind of churchy mode, he is going to resolve this dominant seventh. It's almost like amen at the end. So with this, uh, I will finish my story and invite the quartet to play this wonderful movement for you.
hope you can all join us for Marina's next lecture in the series, which will be on musical cadences on the 22nd of January. Um, please join me once again in thanking Marina and the Bodman Quartet for such a wonderful performance. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.